Hello, everybody. I would like to uh, thank Pedro and Arplus for this invitation. I don't know if um, Pedro announced it in the beginning. We are, because I missed the beginning. We are uh, here uh, with the Technical University Berlin and the uh, ETH Zurich, uh, the Art Academy Berlin, uh, to do a workshop, a summer school, uh, with the title Tropical Architecture in the Anthropocene. And I thought for this input, uh, I rather will um, come up with a reflection than showing projects. So this reflection is related to the topic of the post oil city and how, can, how we can think the post oil city. Um, this image is very exemplary, I think, for the moment, and maybe we could even say that we could exchange the icon of the Cocovado with this um, oil island, huh? because um, as many of you, or as you know, they discovered uh, huge amounts of oil uh, in the in close proximity of uh, Rio de Janeiro's coast. In 2007, the former president of Petrobras announced uh, to produce 5.7 million barrels uh, oil per day starting from 2020. This accounts uh, for about half of the oil production of a country like Saudi Arabia. So this is a huge move uh, and um, uh, the discovery of oil uh, boosted somehow the economy, um, e even though it's a very difficult endeavor because the oil is, is very deep. But probably um, the discovery of oil will have an impact that we cannot foresee right now, not only for Rio de Janeiro, but also for the country as a whole, which will, which will overpass also, uh, let's say, the effect of the Olympic Games and things like that. Shortly uh, after Petrobras announced that it has uh, um, raised its investments plan by 55% from 112.4 billion to 174.4 billion uh, US dollars. So these are um, uh, huge investments, investments to be made. You can imagine uh, the investments go mainly into infrastructure uh, that is related to the extraction of oil. In comparison, uh, the social housing program, Minya Casa, Minya Vida, that we are working on right now, um, had a budget from 2009 to 2014, so approximately the same period of um, 80 billion US dollars, which is half of it, in order to produce um, 2 million houses. I wanted just to present these numbers because these numbers show that we are in the middle of the oil century, not the post-oil century. Uh, and um, even though Petrobras um, has kind of, you know, the, the, the market value of Petrobras was uh, totally declining because of the corruption scandal, I don't actually know when the post-oil period will start, right? So probably they will recover in a in a certain uh, way and we also know that uh, a lot of oil findings point in a direction where it probably will be uh, the next generation that will be in you know in the, kind of the generation to develop the post, post oil period however for this lecture that was my question exactly what is the post oil period no? what what are the hints and what are the possibilities? What is the background? What is the thinking that goes into uh, how to develop infrastructure for the post-oil period? And um, I'm relating to a book um, that um, I edited with the e research group of the ETH Zurich, which is called um, Empower. Um, and in this book, uh, actually, it's a lot about uh, the new uh, age uh, we are kind of moving into, uh, some geologists called this new age the Anthropocene. I want to take you to a trip to the Amazon, because I think the Amazon is a very interesting um, environment to think about the future of the planet. And this image that is taken in, this, uh, in the 60s, 50s, 60s, I think it shows exactly what it is about. This Indio boy uh, looking at the airplane arriving in the uh, Amazon. 
the Amazon was uh, actually uh, an area that was kind of the target of um, infrastructure development in the country during, uh, mainly during the military regime. Paulo Tavares showed that in, in an ar article uh, where he described the political um, ecology uh, of the development of this region. This map is kind of obvious and you know the tropical, uh, the Amazon forest uh, accounts for I think a third of the uh, rainforests of the world so it's a major organism uh, that guarantees life on earth. Uh, in green you see the de deforested areas that were already deforested so probably it's um, more than a third of the tropical Amazon forest is already gone and cannot be easily uh, recovered. Uh, I want to read a quote by uh, Michel Serres. If there is material, technological and industrial pollution that exposes the climate to conceivable risk, there is a second invisible pollution, sorry, a second invisible pollution that endangers time, which is called the cultural pollution. So we're not only polluted ecologically, you know, uh, but there is a, a, a cultural pollution, as uh, Michel Serre uh, is uh, stating it. Uh, staying in the Amazon forest, um, I want to show you a, a project that could show in a positive direction how to deal uh, with nature and how to establish a culture. In 1999, um, geologists found out with satellite images some strange figures occurring in the Amazon uh, uh, area. Uh, 200 of these round-shaped glyphs, uh, how they called it, uh, they first, of, first they didn't know what it is, and um, archaeologists examined these glyphs and found out that, is a, that it is a testimony of a, a culture that was living in the Amazon area, maybe around 900 or, uh, let's say, in, the, in the, what we call the Middle Age. And this culture... Um, uh, created uh, some ritual, ritual um, how do you say, sites, and this is just, these are the remains of the ritual sites. What is quite amazing is that uh, biologists found out that in these areas the bio biodiversity is much higher than in uh, the regular um, rainforest, and uh, there was a particular finding that the amount of terra preta is particularly high. Uh, the terra preta the black earth is a, a very carbon-rich uh, kind of earth. You can see it here. And it's a highly fertile earth that was um, you know, found in high amounts exactly in these areas, which shows um, that you know, uh, if people establish a culture you know, that is, knows how to deal with nature, actually nature is even more productive is even more sustainable in a way that, uh, than just the nature by itself. So this is also uh, going into the argument of the Anthropocene. As you might know, uh, uh, geologists um, are saying uh, we are on a, a jump from one geological age uh, that uh, took now 20,000 years and we are jumping now into another age. Because, you know, these ages of the Earth, they are quite stable for a certain period in climate, geology and vegetation. And this was the case for the last 20,000 years. And now we are about to jump. The climate is definitely changing and with that the geology and also the vegetation is changing. What is different from before is that now this change is mainly caused by human activity. This, that's why it is called uh, the Anthropocene, eh? uh, caused by human uh, the, yeah, human. Uh, human activities, let's say. Um, a second article by Keller Easterling in this book is um, dealing with how to rethink uh, the development paradigm. Uh, it's related to initiative that took place in the Yazuni National Park in Ecuador. Uh, they found huge amount of oil underneath the earth of this national park that has also a great uh, biological diversity. And um, the initi initiative was to save uh, uh, the that and not to extract the oil uh, by uh, gathering a lot of money. They wanted to, I don't know, they wanted to find one billion US dollars. Ne? And with this initiative, they wanted to save the Amazon 
uh, yeah, the Amazon forest. This initiative uh, finally failed. They didn't get enough money. Uh, and now they're going to extract the oil in Ecuador uh, because it's important economically for the country. Uh, but this also shows that we have to um, somehow change the values because the idea of uh, uh, this project was that um, you know, building back infrastructure or like, um, you know, re undoing what is meant to be done uh, can also create a value and our value system is just wrong. Our value system is based on a kind of petrol logic, you know, and on a growth logic. Uh, and you know it also with the carbon credit system, you know, uh, the carbon credit system is an attempt to introduce a new currency that would be able to change the kind of value uh, um, how we develop né, in general. And my last contribution is related to a mining town in, um, in, in the north of Brazil, where we are now working on a pilot project. This is also the reason why we did the uh, workshop here, because it's a kind of preparation for the pilot project in this, sound, uh, in this town. This town is located on the edge of the Amazon uh, forest, uh, and is actually close to the biggest iron ore, uh, open or <laughs> open pit iron ore of the world, uh, the mine of Karajais, uh, where they extract huge, huge amount of iron and ship it mainly to China and to Asia. And this city is really located on the edge of the Amazon, so it's a frontier town in the in a classical sense, you know, like the f the frontier where civilization is moving into the uh, nature and push it the limit forward. In the same time, it's an incredible logistic operation that is happening here. You see the control room where they overlook what is happening from the Amazon forest to the port uh, of Maranhão uh, in, in Saint Louis, Maranhão, until uh, uh, the boats reach uh, China. This city has 250,000 inhabitants. In here, you can see clearly how it uh, is right located at the edge of the Amazon forest. And it's uh, uh, growing so rapidly that you cannot cope with the growth. It's, uh, you know, right now the fastest growing cities of Brazil are related to resource e extraction, uh, uh, hydrologic dams that they built in these areas, uh, but also extensive farming like so soja production. So probably these are the new towns no, of the new century. Uh, that is where the focus is, where uh, you have all the resources available and you know very well uh, Brazil is one of the countries that is, uh, has the highest amount of uh, resources and even accounts of 12% uh, of the water resources of the world. Uh, now, how could you develop these uh, cities when, they, when it grows so fast? The question is here how you build uh, as many as houses as possible per day. So it's the logic of speed uh, to develop those. And the uh, progr program Minha Casa Minha Vida is establishing this, um, how, or is providing these housing, houses uh, uh, with a logic that is related to the big construction industries. And the big extraction industries we can see right now are directly <laughs> related to the petrol industries. As we know, some of the bosses of these big companies are sitting now in jail because the corruption general, uh, scandal even reaches these companies. So it's the logic of uh, uh, growth, the logic of rapid growth. And with all that, you know, the logic of building cities remote, uh, building uh, uh, housing areas, you know, uh, uh, in areas where land is cheap, so it's not um, really centralized. Uh, you need more money to build more infrastructure and so it, it's the development machine that is in place here. This is before, after, um, you know, we were there six months before and now they built already new uh, housing complexes. So how can we think these new, new situations, the new towns of the coming up centuries? Uh, it was very interesting that Nicole showed in the beginning also the project in Ethiopia because um, you know, the uh, ETH research uh, spent three years on uh, researching the situation in Ethiopia, which is related to the Nest Town project, a kind of a cooperative development of um, an agricultural town in the rural area of 
uh, Ethiopia. Here, similarly, um, uh, we moved to the context of Brazil and after studying the favelas, we finally were interested in, in how city develop, cities develop uh, closely related to um, research extraction. How can we change the paradigm of like uh, uh, a new, uh, or introducing a new culture of development. No? I think this is the biggest task, and it's not only about ecology. It's also about um, social development. So uh, ecology and sociology is uh, closely related uh, uh, in this sense, which also showed the research that was done in the Amazon. The geological imperative that I showed in the beginning showed how uh, they call it ecocide, ne? so the, the violence against nature is related with uh, the violence against the people. Uh? And in this sense, I, I think we will only manage to move forward in the age of the Anthropocene if we uh, push hardly uh, for a new uh, paradigm how we develop uh, ecologically, socially, uh, and also economically, uh, which was or which is <laughs> the main subject of the summer school uh, that we are doing uh, right now in Rio de Janeiro. Obrigado.